So before um, Dr. Uh, Terry Norton gets started, I'd like to share some um, background information on her. Uh, first, Terry uh, is a uh, graduate of an HBCU, Lord a and State University. Mm -hmm. um, and um, her current position is Associate Dean for Students and Strategic Initiatives. And she's also a professor uh, in the Civil and Environmental Engineering Department at Bucknell University. Um, prior to Terry transitioning to her new leadership role, she um, was uh, a um, professor um, at the University of Nebraska Lincoln. Uh, she was there for about 11 years. Um, and while at that institution, um, a lot of her research interest uh, dealt with evaluating the effects of hazards, hazards on civil structures, debris management, and disaster reconstruction. Uh, she was a Fulbright research scholar in Japan uh, as it relates to her research on debris management and reconstruction following the 2011 Great East Japan earthquake and tsunami. Uh, she has uh, obtained a funding from a number of governmental sources um, and she was also elected uh, to be a part of the Earthquake Engineering Research Institute Board of Directors and is an invited member of the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine Resilient American Roundtable. Um, Terry is also uh, one of the uh, initial members of our um, MATC cadre uh, when we started back in 2010. And she uh, spent a lot of time participating in all of the MATC conferences uh, as it relates to HBCUs, MSIs, HSIs. So she's very familiar with this program and, and, and certainly knows the impact of it and have also had several of her students uh, attend. So with that, uh, Dr. Norton, we welcome you to uh, present uh, your uh, presentation to us today. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Perkins. And thank you, Dr. Rillette, for inviting me back to the Maxi Scholars Program. It has been a couple years, so I am excited to join this group again. Um, I hope you all will humor me. I'm going to present something that's a slight departure from transportation. Um, however, my background is civil engineering, structural um, emphasis, but my work primarily focuses on disaster recovery, disaster resilience. Um, and so I'm going to share some research experiences and student immersions um, from that lens. So the title of today's talk is Building Solidarity Through, excuse me, During Disaster Reconnaissance with Student Immersion and Field Studies. Um, before I get into my talk, I want to identify this photo here um, in the tent cities, um, a part of one of the reconnaissance missions I went on with some graduate students um, in the Virgin Islands. And so that was our tent city. Um, there were no hotels available during that time following um, that particular disaster event. And so we were camping out and that was actually my first time camping. Um, so ask me questions about that later, I'd be happy to share. So in my title, I'll talk about solidarity. So what is solidarity? I'd like to hear from you all in the audience on the Zoom. I'm gonna do a Zoom chat. So when you hear solidarity, I want you to type something in the chat, but don't send yet. Um, I'm gonna give you about 20 seconds to think about what is solidarity. Type it in the chat. And then when I hit go or say go, I want everyone to storm the chat by entering what they believe solidarity is. So I'll give you a couple of seconds. So go ahead and think about what is solidarity. And you might wanna think about it from the lens of disaster recovery, disaster research. A couple more seconds. Okay, hit enter. Everybody storm the chat on what they think solidarity is. I see unity, helping and in need, independence, linking minds together, togetherness. Those are all good answers. I'm going to use the working definition by Edmund Safra in his 2020 uh, white paper. Well, solidarity is a unity of feeling, 
sentiment sorry, my, among a group of people who share a common objective or interest. So it basically means is, is shared in that chat, togetherness, unity, working together collaboratively, um, partnership, cooper cooperation. Um, so thinking of disaster reconnaissance work, um, when I am going into a reconnaissance event or a field study, I wanna make sure that I'm working in solidarity with the um, community, with those that are impacted, because it's important that I work together and cooperatively and collaboratively with those that are trying to go through this recovery event. So that line of my talk today, I'll first tell a little bit about me and I'll be brief because Dr. Perkins gave that really good introduction of my background. I'll talk a little bit about how I define resilience and what it means for the work that I do, um, mitigation and recovery. And then I'll show some examples of how I've engaged some students, both undergraduate and graduate students in the research that I through, do through reconnaissance and student immersion. And then I'll have some concluding remarks. So about me, Terry Norton, I'm originally from Tampa, Florida. Um, I have an identical twin sister who is also an engineer. So she is my partner in crime for all things fun. Um, as Dr. Perkins shared, I was previously at the University of Nebraska Lincoln where I was there for over 11 years doing research and disaster recovery work um, through the Durham School of Architectural Engineering and Construction. Um, Prior to that, I was at the Aerospace Corporation where I worked in their Vehicle Systems Division Structural Dynamics Department. Um, so that means for a little bit of time, I was actually a rocket scientist. Um, I was able to use those skills that I learned in my undergraduate and graduate career with mechanics and dynamics and vibrations to take that to the aerospace engineering um, arena. Since then, I've been able to do research all across the globe, including my Fulbright research in Japan, um, as Dr. Perkins has shared following that earthquake and tsunami in 2011. I've also been able to expose my students to that experience. Um, and so the last time I talked for Matt, see, I shared a little bit about my work in Japan and how I was also able to take some of my undergraduate students with me um, to do some immersive learning um, in Japan. I have a passion and I know the previous speaker gave some great words of wisdom and she talked a lot about passion I have a passion for educating, encouraging, and empowering um, those that are coming behind me, particularly those from underrepresented backgrounds. Um, I call myself a STEM multiplier or a torchbearer in the STEM arena. Um, so that's a little bit about me. In my work, I use the definition of resilience. Um, if I were to categorize my work in disaster recovery and resilience uh, would be the term used. Uh, this is the uh, resilience curve as defined by performance-based design um, arena in terms of the work that we do. Looking at this curve, we have some common definitions. We are looking at hazards from some type of event, um, whether natural, uh, weather-borne, man-made, some type of event that can cause a hazard. Um, exposure are those incidents or incidents in which things can happen to it. So it can be inhabitants, it can be industry, it can be facilities. Um, those are separate exposure categories. And then we look at defining vulnerability as some type of weakness to some human or social system. Um, and resilience is the speed at which things recover or bounce back. So if I look at that triangle, um, and I don't know if you all can see my arrow, but if I look at this triangle on this curve, the area under that triangle would be what I define as resilience. So the goal for disaster recovery work and in the resilience lens is either to look at the y-axis, which is vulnerability, and the x-axis, which is exposure. So if I want to increase my resilience, I need to do something about reducing the size of that triangle. So one way to reduce uh, the size of that triangle to be more resilient is prevention. So if I reduce my vulnerability, that's in the area of prevention. But if I want to, it's, avert what's happening with that hazard or disaster, that means I need to decrease my exposure. All in all, if I want to increase my resilience, I am looking at mitigation. Um, and that can be a combination of both prevention and aversion. Um, but the overall goal is in order to increase my resilience, the speed in which a community and infected area can bounce back is to look at both of those preventions and aversions to create some type of mitigation strategy. Now let's see that in a cartoon. In this cartoon shared by one of my colleagues at Tohoku University in Japan, 
Um, if my hazard is this boulder sitting on top of this hill, that vulnerable population is the blue man. There's a possibility there may be some type of disaster event because of that boulder. So if that boulder were to roll down the hill, that means my disaster is a function of the hazard itself and the vulnerable population. If I am prepared, if a community is prepared, that means that they're able to resist what's, what that potential hazard may be. So preparedness is an important portion of our disaster recovery and disaster management cycle. Response, in the event that the vulnerable population was not able to respond in a way that they wouldn't be injured or hurt or um, a structure would be damaged, then we have to have responders there in order to uh, mitigate the incident. And then recovery means that the vulnerable populations are now doing better. They're getting back to where they were, in some cases back to normal or back building back better. Um, but there is some recovery that can be short-term or long-term depending on the type of disaster events. In that recovery phase, uh, we as researchers or disasters researchers look at how we can mitigate future disaster events. That, that can be by either some type of structural mitigation as seen here, building some protective structures around vulnerable populations so that future hazards don't become disasters. Or it can be by mitigation in terms of land, land use. Our urban planners are really good at determining what type of areas or buffers are needed to limit the amount of disaster exposure to a particular hazard. So in terms of my work, these cartoons help illustrate what, what I need to do in terms of a disaster researcher. When I go into the field and I'm looking at an event that's happened, a reconnaissance uh, field trip or field study, I'm looking at determining ways in which we can mitigate future disasters. So we use reconnaissance as a tool to do that. So my journey in terms of disaster reconnaissance work started as a graduate student. Um, as Dr. Perkins shared, I graduated from Florida a &M University um, or the Florida State Florida a &M University College of Engineering. Um, and Dr. Chima, I think he's on the line. He's one of my uh, colleagues from grad school. So my first experience in disaster reconnaissance was as a graduate student. I went to um, Molise, Italy after the 2003 Molise earthquake. Um, and that was an opportunity for me to learn experientially outside the classroom of what happens when an earthquake impacts a community, what happens to our structural systems when they're vulnerable to earthquakes. Um, and then I went on to work with some colleagues at University of Florida studying the 2005 Hurricane Charlie event. Um, and that was also an, uh, another opportunity for field studies. Fast forward, these pictures here show me in the field in my home state of Florida. Um, and this was following 2017 hurricane season. Um, and on the picture of the left, this is actually a gas station um, that was damaged by Hurricane Irma. Um, and this is not far from my parents' home. Um, and then the picture on the right is some damage um, from some tree damage that was due to the wind hazard from Hurricane Irma, um, also not far from one of my relatives. So the scope in which my interest in terms of disaster reconnaissance is close to home because hurricanes happen in Florida, and we're exposed to those type of disasters, but more broadly, having the opportunity to experience disasters on a broader scale, a global scale, by being exposed to research in the area of disaster reconnaissance and going to Italy and going to other places to learn how those researchers, those engineers, how they respond and design based on these type of vulnerabilities. So the process of doing a field study, and I'll talk a little bit about the process first, and then I'll share, as I said, some experiences. When going in the field, um, these are the basic steps that we use um, when starting a field study. Understanding what disaster or hazard we're going to investigate, what size response team we're putting together, whether it's a small local team um, that we can coordinate with, or if it's a larger, more formalized reconnaissance team that may have different actors from academics to uh, urban planners to uh, practitioners to government offices, um, that would be a formalized uh, reconnaissance team. Before going to field, we have to make sure that we have clearance and access to certain areas. Um, depending on the size of disaster event, the level of clearances may vary. And so it's important that we do that homework before getting to field 
because there's nothing worse than getting to a reconnaissance trip and not having access to the area or facilities that you really want to study or you really want to have an impact on creating some mitigation strategy for. In terms of actually traveling, um, this goes without saying, make sure you have the proper equipment and clothing. Um, if it's international, make sure you have your, your passport and immunization that's all required. Um, and travel arrangements work collaboratively with your team and local travel agencies because sometimes getting around, especially international sites, um, can be challenging. So you wanna make sure you familiarize yourself with the destination prior to going, and also you make arrangements for how to get around and how to have access to your field sites. And then once you get there, it's all about data collection um, and then reporting at the end so that you can disseminate your work in a way that it not only helps create new mitigation strategies, but it also helps a community, which is most important, helping that community recover. For opportunities that you would like to go on for a disaster reconnaissance trip, you may not be able to go physically. Um, there are uh, resources where you can do virtual disaster reconnaissance. Um, the EERI, the Earthquake Engineering Research Institute, has a virtual portal or clearinghouse in which they have a lot of disaster events that as a, a researcher, you can use data sets that are provided by other researchers who are able to go to field. Um, you can collaborate with researchers across the country that are studying the same type of disaster that um, you're interested in. And also you can use it as a way to learn more about a disaster event. So this is EERI's portal, um, but there's a broader portal by Design Safe CI um, for natural hazards, engineering research infrastructure. And this particular portal has a broad range of hazards and all across the globe from earthquakes to tsunamis to hurricanes to flood events. Um, Design Safe CI is a great resource for collaboration, for sharing research, um, for getting data for research studies. Um, it's it's a, a platform that's mostly faceted. It's, um, it's supplied by or funded by the National Science Foundation, um, but it also has researchers from academics to practitioners, as I said, in governmental offices. Um, that are looking to do disaster work. One way in which we collaborate in the field is by Slack. And I'm sure in this remote environment, this learning environment that we've all found ourselves in, many of you may have used Slack um, for communication tools or software for your classes. By a show of hand, I can't see. Maybe put in the chat if you've used Slack before. Um, it's a, a tool that's used um, pretty frequently in our disaster recovery work. Not only can you chat in the feature, but you can share data files, you can share videos, um, you can uh, communicate with your team more broadly. Um, and so this is a, a, a Slack channel that's provided by Design Safe CI, but there are other Slack channels, as you may know, that are created um, that can be used for collaboration in terms of the work that you do. Um, and this is one that I particularly use for when I'm going on field studies. The Converge Network, um, I talked a little bit about Design Safe through um, Nahiri that's funded by NSF. Um, Converge facility was a, a new facility that was created, I believe, back in 2018. It was a way in which um, to bring together all of the natural hazards um, research institutes and facilities that were funded by NSF. Um, from the rapid reconnaissance facility on the left to the infrastructure facility, which is Nahiri, um, to the extreme, the, the extreme events, reconnaissance um, teams and networks. Um, there are four listed here, and it also brings together engineers and social scientists and practitioners. Um, and so Converge is, is, a, is situated at University of Colorado Boulder, um, but it engages in a way that it connects all um, entities that are doing disaster reconnaissance work, whether you're a social scientist, whether you're an emergency manager, uh, you're a structural engineer or civil engineer, um, looking at built environment, infrastructure, um, you name it, um, anything that um, deals with disaster recovery or some type of exposure to disaster, it may be connected to the Converge Network. Um, many of our research facilities at some of our universities are also connected to Converge. Um, listed here in the center of that circle are four of the ears, four of the networks, but there are actually seven in total. I think not listed here is the Systems um, Extreme Event Network and also the um, Sustainable materials is also not listed here. So another definition. When looking into disaster recovery and working in the area of impact to communities, 
what is cultural competence and why do I need it? Um, when you think of cultural competence, we're gonna do another uh, chat storm. Cultural competence, what is it? Take a few seconds and throw it in the chat. I'm giving you the definition. I didn't mean to do that, but since it's on the screen, I'm going to show it. Um, so for cultural competency, um, it's really important, um, especially as engineers, when we're going to a community, a community that's impacted by a disaster, uh, a community that um, may be traumatized in some instances, um, we want to make sure that when we're going into those particular situations, that we're not going in with a savior mentality. Um, we as researchers are there not only to learn about an event, but we're also there to work cooperatively, collaboratively with communities. And so cultural competence is about this congruent behaviors, um, attitudes and politics. Um, it's about coming together um, as a system, as an agency, professionals um, to do the work in a way that is cross-cultural, it's, it's cross-cultural cutting, um, it's effectively, but in a way, as I said, that is aiding the recovery efforts and not, again, with that savior mentality. It's about using your knowledge and interpersonal skills, um, making sure that you understand, appreciate the individuals that you are working with, those communities, um, community leaders, governmental agencies, and we're going into those, uh, those situations. We wanna make sure, again, that we're using um, this solidarity behavior, this mentality where we're working together. Um, it's about helping someone recover um, in a way that is beneficial to the and addresses their needs, but also addresses our needs as mitigating for future disasters or hazards. Okay, so let's talk about some of the experiences I've been able to uh, expose my students to in the lens of disaster recovery and reconnaissance. These experiences I'm going to share are focused on the 2017 hurricane season. As shown here in this infographic, um, we see that the hurricanes for 2017 as named. Um, Texas was affected by Hurricane Harvey. Um, and I shared some photos earlier about Hurricane Irma and then Hurricane Maria, Maria was also a big hurricane um, through 2017. Hurricane Harvey um, that impacted Texas was a category four hurricane uh, system. And I believe the estimated damage was about $125 billion worth of damage for Hurricane Harvey. Um, for Hurricane Irma, um, it was a category five um, and its damage um, range, I believe is about $50 billion. So um, considerably less than Harvey. Um, I'll back up and say that Harvey was a flood event um, so most of the damage due to Hurricane Harvey was due to flooding. Um, Hurricane Irma, as I said, Cat 5, it was more of a wind event. And so the response um, and recovery efforts between the two were different. And then Hurricane Maria was a Cat 5. Um, it was also a high wind event. Um, the dollar amount in terms of damage, I believe, is around $100 billion. Um, one interesting point in looking at the Caribbean in this picture is that the Caribbean was impacted by both Hurricane Irma and Hurricane Maria, and I believe about almost a month period. Um, so Hurricane Irma was about the end of um, the end of August, September, and then Hurricane Maria is about the mid August to early, excuse me, mid September to early October. Um, and so within a range of a couple months between like late August and early October, we had Hurricane Harvey, Hurricane Irma, and Hurricane Maria. Um, again, with the Caribbean being inundated by two Cat 5 hurricanes. So my first immersive experience came in 2017, um, where student immersion, I see it as a way for my students um, to learn outside of the classroom. It's a way for them to gain some experience about disaster recovery work while also being able to use their skill sets that they're gaining in their undergraduate career. Um, so this trip that we took um, to Houston in October 2017, I took a group of students from the University of Nebraska um, that were from programs in architectural engineering, construction engineering, and civil engineering. And we partnered with uh, the Seven Day Adventist Disaster Response Team from Nebraska. Um, and they were, uh, 
cohort group from the Nebraska VOAD are the volunteer organizations after disaster. Um, so I work with that group as well as on the ground in Houston, we work with a, a local church, a local seven day Adventist church. Um, while we were there, our students were using their skills of structural engineering, structural design, project management and construction to help those impacted by Hurricane Harvey to rebuild homes, um, to repair damaged areas, um, and also to do some muck and guts, some clean out. And so this is our group listed here in this picture. Um, it was about eight students and myself, and then a couple of um, the volunteers from uh, the disaster response team, the Seven Day Adventist disaster response team in this picture. These other pictures here show some of the work that my students were able to do from drywalling to, um, as I said, mucking up, tearing out things um, that were damaged. Um, in the bottom picture in the center, that's me, my pink hard hat. We were there rebuilding a porch uh, for one of the local residents. Um, and the picture next to that on the left is my construction students. They're measuring out the floor system that we're, is going to be the, the basis for the porch for this local resident. Um, it was an opportunity, as I said, not only for them to use their skills, but also to give back. Um, and so in addition to doing some of the construction work that they did, um, they were also doing some volunteer work with handing out foods. Um, and then we did have a little bit of fun. We got down to Galveston um, and we were able to do some, some social learning um, in Galveston on the beach. Um, being in Nebraska, it was a great opportunity for them to go somewhere where there was a coastline. So we did have a beach day. Um, but we also talked a little bit about the construction um, and architecture there in Galveston. You can see the houses are there on stilts as compared to the houses that we were working on that were flooded. Um, and so there's, you can see the difference in the mitigation strategy for Galveston than the mitigation strategy that were there um, in the areas in which we were working for recovery. When I transitioned to Bucknell, um, I learned that my interest in disaster recovery work and exposing students to disaster recovery work was something that they were already doing at Bucknell. Um, they have a program called Building Global Solidarity at Bucknell where they were working and taking students on immersion trips and service learning trips to communities like Nicaragua. Um, and they were going, I think for about 10 years or so, they were going to New Orleans um, doing the Katrina response team where they would go each year working with uh, St. Bernard Parish and recovery, um, doing homes and urban gardens there. Um, and so when I was able to join Bucknell, I was able to take some of my experience with disaster recovery work um, and expose some more of our students, particularly our engineering students into this work. Um, and so I planned the trip and led the trip that took two teams um, to Houston, as well as a team to Puerto Rico. Um, unfortunately, because this was during a, the 1920 academic year, our team that went to Puerto Rico, they experienced the earthquakes that happened in that January. So um, they didn't get their full immersion trips because we had to fly them home, but um, it was an opportunity for them, at least to, they were going there for hurricane work and they were exposed to earthquake work. Um, so we're hoping to get back down there a little bit later. I also brought another team of undergraduate students to Houston um, in 2019 over the Thanksgiving holiday. I took a group of, uh, excuse me, Bucknell undergraduate students to Houston. Um, similar to the work that I did with the Nebraska VOAD and Seven Day Adventists, um, I formalized a team and we work with local uh, volunteer organizations, um, all hands and hearts. Um, they're a great organization that utilize their volunteers to help our communities recover and rebuild as well as SBP or St. Bernard Parish, they also had an office there in Houston. And so for our students, we had 16 students in total. We broke up into two teams. Um, I took the team with all hands and hearts so we can do some of the, the building and recovery. Um, and the other team that worked with St. Bernard Parish, um, they did some work with some of the local residents, but then they end up working at the local food bank. And so these are some of the pictures. Um, from our group trip there. Our students, as I said, got exposed to rebuilding. Um, we were drywalling, we were painting, um, also had a team that was doing uh, mold remediation. So our students learned how to do that. Um, we got some time out to, to browse around Houston, although because it's Thanksgiving uh, weekend, a lot of things were closed, but we still had fun. Um, so not only was it about, you know, using their skills and growing in terms of um, outside the classroom, um, using those skills outside the classroom, giving back, giving service, 
but also learning about a different area outside of Pennsylvania. Uh, so the students were enjoying a bit of Houston. We went to the Houston Food Bank, as I said, when the teams did that. And we also um, partnered with uh, one of the local urban gardens and we um, learned a little bit about how the urban gardening there in Houston was being done. Now I'm gonna transition from undergraduate students to graduate students and bringing them into disaster recovery work. The minor search capacity and disasters program um, are minor, minority scholars from underrepresented groups in engineering and social sciences and capacity and disasters. It focuses on exposing underrepresented students to hazards and disasters work. Um, those from racial and ethnic minority backgrounds um, that were studying are interested in disaster research, um, both masters and PhD students, and also looking at uh, studying more the impact of disasters in communities that are disproportionately impacted, or those are social vulnerable populations that are impacted by disaster. Uh, this uh, NSF funded uh, research was funded in part by the NSF includes program. Um, and we had our leadership team representing five different institutions um, for myself from Bucknell, University of Al Albany, um, University of Colorado Boulder. Um, we had uh, University of Puerto Rico, Rio Pierdes. And then also we had uh, one of our researchers that, that was at UNO um, transition to Virginia Commonwealth um, throughout uh, this teamwork. Um, and we also had um, partnership with Norma Anderson from the Bill Anderson Fund, uh, which is also a scholars program that I had the opportunity to help develop and create um, for graduate scholars studying hazards and disasters research. I'll talk a little bit more about BAF later. But this is our team leaders. Um, for Surge, um, we invited uh, 20 research scholars, as I said, masters and PhD students from different disciplines our approach for surge was a transdisciplinary research approach, meaning that we were bringing together disciplines, different disciplines coming together to formulate a problem to come up with a common solution um, for research. So we had representation from engineering, architectural engineering, civil engineering, we had urban ecologists, we had environmental scientists, we had emergency managers, um, we also had social scientists. Um, so our team was very diverse and we were looking at the impact of disasters from all of those lenses to come up with our problem statement and how we were going to respond um, and create solutions for communities that were impacted by disasters. If you're interested in learning more about SURGE, you can check out the website, um, but I'll just share a little bit about my role as a leader on this, this program was um, to create our boots on the ground program. And that was our reconnaissance, our field reconnaissance. Um, arm of surge. And so that was to bring disaster management, our hazards and disasters research, as well as community involvement together. Um, it was an opportunity for students, as I said, in that immersion to take the skills, their unique skill set that they've learned and that they're researching in to bring it to a disaster um, impacted area and work with the community collaboratively to determine a solution for recovery. Um, so we conducted field studies um, based on the 2017 hurricane season. Um, as in those pictures I shared earlier, we work with local community leaders, those trusted leaders in the communities. We work with researchers and academics, um, NGOs and local government representatives as well. And so again, it was about us creating partnership and working in solidarity to help those communities recover. And for Surge, um, it was a two year grant for an NSF includes program. Our first year, our boots on the ground experience it took us to the US Virgin Islands, where we partnered with the University of Virgin Islands, um, the St. Thomas uh, Long-Term Recovery Team, or START, um, and some other local NGOs and volunteer organizations to help come up with a strategy for recovering. So this was, as I said, a two-year um, field study. So the first field study was mostly about observation. The second year, once we had created those collaborations and partnerships, we worked together to come up with projects that were going to help aid in the recovery. And so for our team, we broke up into teams of four um, and our projects that we um, came up with working with those, um, those local officers on the ground, whether it was academics or NGOs or volunteer organizations. One was with all hands and all hearts. Um, as I said, that 
that's a global volunteer organization. It was an opportunity for us to continue to do some service and rebuilding. Uh, we also worked with the University of Virgin Islands um, doing some uh, community garden work. Uh, we did some infrastructure data mapping, understanding culverts, and then we work collaboratively with some researchers at the University of South Florida to do some ethnographic uh, data collection. These are some pictures from our first trip in 2018. Um, we were there, as I said, meeting with um, academics, meeting with uh, NGOs and governmental officials and practitioners, learning about um, the impact of those two major hurricanes in um, the Virgin Islands, particularly St. Thomas and St. John. Um, our students had the opportunity to do some service as well as rebuilding, but also replanting some of the mango trees that were damaged there in St. Thomas. Um, and we also were able to go around and learn more about the culture there in the Virgin Islands. Here's some more pictures showing um, our observation. Um, the two pictures at the top is of 2-2 high rise. It's a multifamily dwelling that was damaged um, through the hurricanes. We'll see that the main structural system um, is still there, but some of the uh, curtain walls, interior walls were damaged by uh, the, the windborne um, missiles or, or debris, also by um, just general from wind and wear tear um, damage. At the bottom picture on the right um, is a local elementary school that was had so much debris that was, that was blown onto the roof. Some of the damaged uh, roof structures were damaged. Um, we saw there in the school systems in St. Thomas that because so many schools were damaged, that they had to go to a rotation system in terms of offering classes. Um, in addition, um, the environmental uh, issues that were seen after the storm was increased growth of algae, um, this algae bloom that really um, affected the, the environmental system of the waterway along that coast. Um, so there were some areas that were so covered with algae that it was really impacting um, the uh, the sea biology, some of the, the fish and all the other sea life um, in that area were impacted by this overwhelming gloom of algae. For our second trip, um, prior to going back to St. Thomas, um, because one of our researchers, our team leaders, is from the University of Puerto Rico, we did have the opportunity to go to San Juan and look at the impact of that hurricane season in Puerto Rico. Um, we were there with academics there for our research colloquium, but we also, as I said, we're going there to partner with community leaders um, and researchers to learn about the impacts of that hurricane disaster. Uh, so the picture on the top right, um, they're using gibeons to reinforce the hillside because of there was a landslide after the storm that impacted the roadway. And so um, on our, our trip to get to one of our sites, uh, we pulled over to see how they were using those gibeons to reinforce the stability of the hillside so that the road would not fall down into the ravine. Um, on the bottom left is a picture of a local community center in San Juan, uh, where one of the community leaders is showing us a solar light. Um, and that solar light, if it's blinked on red, that means that the resident in that home is in need of assistance. Or if it was turned on green, that meant that everything was okay. Following our trip to Puerto Rico, we went back to St. Thomas. Um, as I said, in those four teams, um, broken up into ethnographic work, um, infrastructure mapping, uh, community gardens or urban gardens. And then the last team in which I led was using um, the, the skill set that we had from um, working and volunteering services with all hands and hearts. Um, like in Texas, where the students, we were there for work, but we also had the opportunity to be immersed in the culture there. Um, so we had the opportunity to work with some of the local community leaders to, to host a dinner. So it was a team dinner at one of the local restaurants. Um, but we had representatives from the St. Thomas Recovery Team there. We had representatives from the university there, as well as representatives from some of the local governmental offices. Um, for the team that I led um, with all hands and hearts, um, because civil engineer and a structural engineer, I, I'd like to be able to give back to a community that I'm going to. Um, and so my students that the small group that went with me also worked with all hands and hearts again. Uh, we did some training, some skill set with um, using some of the equipment that we needed for rebuilding. Um, for that particular trip, we didn't have to do any muck and gut. We were basically just doing some finishing with painting um, and finalizing some structures there. 
but we were on an island. So although inside it was like a lot of hard work, we could step out to the patio and see um, just how beautiful the water was from our view from the particular home that we were working on. So in terms of surge, um, this experience for students, it was a multi-stage experiential learning process. So to go beyond just student immersion service learning, because for surge, it was for graduate students, we were giving them the opportunity to use their skill sets, things that they were studying, their research um, in the area that was impacted by disaster, but it was also about learning how to engage with communities, how to set up meetings with community leaders and national, and national government offices, um, also to be able to work collaboratively across disciplines. Um, and so I said that be prior to the trip, like the pictures I showed in Puerto Rico, we did some kickoff meetings. The first one was virtual, but the second was actually on site. And um, we did some training, some cultural competency training, some reconnaissance training. Um, and then the students at the end of each year, they had the opportunity to create a publication. And that was presented at the Natural Hazards uh, Workshop, which is a conference that's held annually in Colorado. So not only were they doing research, but they got research publications out of it, which will help them in their academics career moving on, especially for those PhD students. So in terms of disaster reconnaissance and student immersion, um, the opportunities to provide, uh, for me, the opportunity to provide students um, with the skills that's needed to go beyond their academics, to go outside the classroom, to engage in a disaster um, environment, but be able to work in solidarity with communities is really important to me. And so with the surge program, those graduate students, they were able to gain tangible experience, field training um, in the areas of hazards and disaster mitigations. Um, they were able to work to build relationships, collaborative relationships with academic researchers, with disaster experts um, and practitioners. Um, that will help them in their future careers, whether they go into academia or they go into industry or practitioner. And then the service project for the undergraduate students. Um, it also provided them opportunity to learn outside the classroom, to learn how they can use the skills and knowledges that they're gaining in say structural mechanics or structural engineering, or even transportation when we're looking at um, the, uh, the urban infrastructure mapping in St. Thomas using those skills to help create a better community, to help communities recover, um, is what this work um, is all about for me. Um, so before I conclude, I want to share a little bit about the Bill Anderson Fund. As I said, um, Norma Anderson was part of the leadership team for Surge. Um, the Bill Anderson Fund is a nonprofit organization similar to um, the work that's done here at MATC. It provides an opportunity for professional development training and mentoring. Um, for students, graduate students, particularly PhD students that are looking to go into hazards and disaster research. Um, they also have a disaster DAS every year. Um, the program is named after Bill Anderson, who was a National Academy researcher, um, social scientist, um, whose work was really focused on making sure that those from underrepresented communities, um, those impacted by disaster, that they were the focus, um, particularly children that were impacted by disaster. And so if you'd like to learn more, about the Bill Anderson Fund. Um, they have a website. Um, they also have their upcoming 5K Disaster Dash. Um, it's a virtual 5K this year. So if you're interested in running virtually, please feel free um, to let me know and I can share that link with you. So I'm gonna stop there and allow the opportunity for questions. Um, this is my contact information. At any time, if you'd like to reach me, you can email me, but I can also share my contact in the chat. Well, thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, folks, well, we are opening the floor for questions. Ms. Pierce. I have a question. Yes, ma'am. Um, thank you so much for that presentation and just sharing all the different places that you've been um, while helping other people. So I was... Um, I found uh, I was really interested in your trip to St. Thomas. Um, so did you all come up with your background? What were some other, um, well, okay. So I know you said that you guys don't really come there with the savior mentality and I understand that. So were there other methods that were, uh, that was explored as far as like how to make sure that this never happens again? Um, 
that you wanted to share more about? When you say this never happens again, do you mean that a hurricane that doesn't happen again? Or no, that with, uh, okay, so with the algae, you said that it was such a big buildup with the algae and that's what caused the disaster. Yeah, so the, al the buildup of algae um, was, impacting the environmental um, system there. Unfortunately, my background is not environmental, but what they were doing with the overwhelming amount of algae there, they were looking at ways in which they could recycle and reuse it for other things. So in, in the lens of trying to clean up the coastline, they were using that algae for almost like fertilization in certain areas. Um, okay. So that, that was particularly for the algae, but in terms of going to St. Thomas and working with um, the St. Thomas recovery team would start and the academics there at University um, of Virgin Islands. We were there understanding what their needs were. Um, so we didn't go there with a research plan. We went there to engage and um, build networks and collaboration with them and to learn about what their research needs were. Um, because we could come up with our research um, idea and go down there and think that we were going to, you know, do something based on what we saw. Um, yeah. on TV, on screens, but it was important for us to go there and go into meetings with those individuals to learn a full scope of the, the problem and to see it from their eyes, to see what the real problem was. Um, and then from there, work with them to come up with a problem statement, as well as a solution that we're trying to do for research. Okay. Um, one other question. Have you ever had a situation where you were um, working out of the country and you the solution took longer than the amount of time that you all had planned to be there? And um, how did you all solve that problem? So I don't think that is a problem that's unique to going outside of the country. I mean, that's the nature of research. You start right. with idea and timeline in mind, and sometimes it takes longer. Sometimes you right. have to ask for an extension for your research funding, or you have to say, this is part of my future work um, as a graduate student. Um, so there are always instances where you go in there with a plan and a timeline, and it may be that the data that you were planning to use for your research, you thought you were gonna get it automatically by just connecting with the local representative there, but it took you know weeks or to get clearance to have a meeting with that individual before you could even get data. And so that put your timeline back by three to four weeks. Um, so things like that happen. Um, if you don't schedule into your timeline some type of float time um, for construction, those critical path methods where you have some type of float time in your timeline. If you don't automatically have that, then there may be instances where you know you don't get everything done that you hope to get done. Um, but you have to make sure that your milestones are set such that um, you your research is in a way that there is an endpoint, um, even if it's not the final point that you were hoping to get. But you do have some type of resolution or milestone endpoint that you can get to and call what you've done the first stage of a complete work. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Chica, did you have one, um, a question? No, ma'am. Okay. Uh, Terry, I do have uh, two. Um, one, what's the maximum amount of time that you guys have um, spent out of the country at a one given trip? That's the first question. And then the next one is, um, while you were at University of Nebraska-Lincoln and also while you're now at Bucknell, did um, you reach out to Engineers Without Borders chapters to collaborate because they do some of the same types of projects that your program is doing? Yeah, so the answer to the first question, for the undergraduate trips, um, mm -hmm. the longest trip we've been on with undergraduate students has been, for me, has been 10 days. Uh, the trip that I took students to Japan was about 10 days. Um, the other trips, like to Houston, for both ne Nebraska students and Bucknell students, those were like a four-day trip. Those are shorter trips. Um, for graduate students, those trips can be a little bit longer. Um, for our surge trip, the first time we went to St. Thomas and um, St. John in the Virgin Islands, I think it was like a week and a half. Um, but we did have some students, um, some graduate students that connected with the researchers there. So by the second trip, they were they went ahead of us. And so they had a couple of weeks, you know, to work collaboratively with those researchers there ahead of us. Um, so it depends on um, the research problem or project that the students are working on. But in terms of just the immersion experience for undergraduates is about the week. Okay. 
And then a second question about Engineers Without Borders. Um, unfortunately, at Bucknell, there isn't an active Engineers Without Borders chapter. Um, what they have is Engineers in Action um, that we're working with. So I'm familiar with Engineers Without Borders at Nebraska, but in Bucknell, they didn't have that. Um, and so we were working outside of that group. Um, so yeah, we, we didn't connect with them, um, nor did we connect with them when we were in Houston, but we did go to, um, sorry, I didn't come to Prairie View while we were there in Houston, but we did go to um, uh, Texas Southern, no. Shame on you, but anyway. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, we did go to a school there, but it wasn't, it wasn't Prairie View, so I apologize. No um, I think when we reached out to you, like the schedule didn't, I apologize. You That's know, not... oh, Kendall. Oh, Kendall, but she didn't see you. We, we know what happened. <laughs> <laughs> no worries, no worries. Uh, uh, Chica, it looks like you have a question. Now I have a question. Uh -oh. um, I was just going to ask about your experience with the um, with the camping, the tent, because I know you said that was your first one. Um, I've never really been either. So how was your experience with that? Okay, so yeah, I, I bought these tents. And so because me and my students were going to, at that portion, going to be in tents. Um, I bought these tents online. I did some research. Um, I have a deck on the back of my house in Pennsylvania. And so I practiced. I popped the tent and I went out on the deck to just get the feel for it. But when we actually got there in the Virgin Islands, um, we were in um, Carmel Beach, which was a national park. And so the area in which we had our tent city was in the national park. Um, unfortunately, we didn't have, like I said, electricity or anything there, but being in the tent was okay. Um, I made sure that we had sleeping bags with the extra air mattress or pad because we were sleeping on the ground. Um, we had solar showers. Um, we had porta potties for restrooms. Um, there were animals outside. I remember one morning coming outside of my tent, brushing my teeth, and there was a deer outside the tent. So I was brushing my teeth with a neighbor. Um, so it was, it was a unique experience. I didn't think that um, I wasn't sure if I was going to enjoy it at all, but I've learned in my um, work, especially in disaster reconnaissance, where you're going in places that are destructed, um, you have to think outside your comfort zone. You have to understand you're not going to have your, your normal, um, you know, amenities and luxuries that you would have, say, to go to a hotel or to have running water or to have power. So um, I had already in my mind that it wasn't going to be like being at home, but just being outdoors. I was worried about mosquitoes and things like that, but you know, we make sure we had repellent and all of that stuff. So. Um, and you didn't mention solar showers. What are mm -hmm. those? Okay. So a solar shower is basically like uh, an enclosure, like almost like a, a dressing room that you go to like in the store, but it was really flimsy, almost like a vertical tube. And then the solar shower itself is like a bag of water and it has like a solar panel on it. So it heats the water. And so when you actually like release the valve for the shower to come out, it's a little warm. So you're basically taking a shower outdoors. Um, sometimes it's warm, but it's really like lukewarm. Um, it was either that or to take a shower with a bucket. So you had two choices. Um, I chose a solar shower. That's nice. Thank you. You're welcome. Right. Well, we appreciate it. Uh, any any last uh, minute questions? All right. Well, Dr. Northern, thank you so much for your time on this Saturday uh, prior to Easter Sunday. And we appreciate you sharing uh, your experiences uh, with uh, all of us. Uh, they're showing their, their uh, accolades in terms of the emojis with the hands. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Well, thank you all for taking the time to listen to my experience. As I said, feel free to reach out. Um, I will put my contact information in chat um, if you have any questions or if you're looking to join some research that I'm doing. 